Let's look at how we can use radioactive elements in rocks to determine their age. This is called radiometric or absolute rock dating. This is the process where we use spontaneous yet predictable radioactive decay to determine the ages of rocks. Many igneous rocks contain radioactive elements that allow the time since their formation to be determined. This is a powerful tool that allows us to determine the age of these rocks and the surrounding objects. Let's first look at some important terms that will help us understand this process. The first is radioactive decay. Radioactive decay is the spontaneous breakdown of a nucleus into matter and energy. There are many processes that fall into the category of radioactive decay, but they all have similar patterns and similar characteristics. Our next word is isotope. An isotope is two or more atoms that have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. Because they have the same number of protons, they are the same type of element, but because of the different number of neutrons, they have a different atomic mass. For example, we might have carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Each of these isotopes of carbon has the same number of protons, which is six, but a different number of neutrons, which is six, seven, and eight, respectively. Next is a parent atom. A parent atom is the atom before it undergoes radioactive decay, which is followed by daughter atom. A daughter atom is the atom after it has already undergone radioactive decay. Our final important term is a half-life, which is the amount of time it takes for half of the parent atoms to decay into daughter atoms. Now every radioactive isotope has a specific half-life. For example, carbon-14 has a half-life of about 5,730 years, while uranium-235 has a half-life of about 704 million years. From these examples, we can see that the length of time of a half-life between elements can vary greatly, and it is dependent upon the specific isotope. Let's look a little more at this term half-life. We can understand it better if we look at a graph. On the vertical axis, we have the percentage of parent atoms remaining in that rock sample from 100% down to 0%. On the horizontal axis, we have the number of half-lives. If we look again at the definition of half-life, which is the amount of time it takes for half of the parents to decay into daughters, we can see that each half-life reduces the percentage of parents in that rock sample. If we look at this closely, we can see that at zero half-lives, or at the moment of formation of that rock, we would have 100% of the parent atoms. At one half-life, half of those parent atoms would have decayed into daughters, so our percentage of parent atoms would be 50%. After another half-life, or on the second half-life, that 50% of parent atoms would have decreased by half, so it would now be 25% of the original parent atoms and all the rest have turned into daughter atoms. If we continue this pattern of half of the parent atoms decaying into daughter atoms every half-life, we can see that, like we said, there are 50% of the parent atoms remaining after one half-life. After two half-lives, there are 25% of the parent atoms remaining. After three half-lives, there are 12.5% of the remaining parent atoms. After four half-lives, there are 6.25% of the parent atoms. So in the simplest form of radioactive decay, the percentage of parent atoms compared to the percentage of daughter atoms helps us to determine the number of half-lives that have elapsed. Keep in mind that radioactive decay is a spontaneous event. We cannot look at a single radioactive element and predict exactly when it will decay. But when we look at a large number of elements, it becomes a predictable pattern. Let's compare this to what's cited as probably the most common everyday random or spontaneous event. This is a coin flip. It's true that with any single coin flip, it's impossible to predict whether it'll be heads or tails. However, if we look at hundreds of thousands or even millions of coin flips, it becomes a very predictable pattern. The results will be very close to 50% heads and 50% tails. This is very similar to what happens in radioactive decay. Just like the coin flip, we cannot predict exactly when any singular atom will decay, but as we look at a large number of them, it becomes a predictable pattern. This pattern of half-lives, where half of the parents decay into daughters every half-life. And as was stated earlier, each radioactive isotope has its own unique half-life, or the amount of time it takes for half of the parents to decay into daughters. Let's look more closely at how this relates to rocks. 
When we're talking about radioactive decay, in nearly all situations, we're talking about igneous rock. This is because when an igneous rock pools or forms from magma or lava, the radioactive clock starts from zero. What is meant by this is in the simplest form, there are 100% parent atoms and 0% daughter atoms. This makes it a reliable clock for us to monitor the ratio between the parent atoms and the daughter atoms and use this to determine the age of the rock. And once that igneous rock solidifies, the parent atoms begin to spontaneously decay into daughter atoms. So we use these properties of igneous rocks to analyze the percentage of parent atoms compared to daughter atoms. Again, in its simplest form, we look at that percentage or that ratio to parents to daughters to determine how many half-lives have elapsed. And then we can use how long a half-life of that specific isotope is to determine the age of that rock. Let's say, for example, we have a rock sample that contains a ratio of 12.5% of the parent atom, uranium-235, and 87.5% of the daughter atom, which is lead. Using this ratio of parent atoms to daughter atoms, we can determine how many half-lives have elapsed since this rock was first formed. If we look back at our graph, we can see that a sample that contains 12.5% of the parent atoms has undergone three half-lives. Our next step is to multiply the number of half-lives by how long a half-life is for uranium-235. Now if we multiply the number of half-lives, which is three in the case of this sample, by the length of a half-life for uranium-235, which is 704 million years, we can determine that this rock is over two billion years old. Now this is a very simple example of how absolute or radiometric rock dating is used to determine the age of rocks but it applies to the general principles and the general processes that are used to determine the age of rocks, fossils, and other items.